Hello and welcome to another episode of the Golden Hour Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Mays, a.k.a. Dave Altizer. The reason that's important today is because we're speaking to my father, Rick Altizer, in his office. This is actually your office space. Yes. We kind of reconfigured this little corner of your office. Over here to my left is your editing suite where you edit movies. Um, my dad is an amazing guy and I really am blessed to have him because I grew up with a creative father who is a musician and a, and a filmmaker. I obviously know your story. Uh, a lot of people who listen to this may not. So tell me about yourself, Rick Altizer, or as I like to say, dad. <laughs> well, first off, it's an honor to be on my son's show. It's awesome. It's great to be this on. This is the, awesome. To be on my <laughs> son's show. Um, I actually have a podcast and you've been on like four times, I think, yep. on my show. So I'm glad I finally made the cut to get onto your show. Oh, Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I uh, uh, was uh, in the music industry. I was a, a started out as a songwriter in Los Angeles for Warner Brothers, Warner Chapel. I was a staff writer there. Then went on to be, uh, you know, tried to get, tried to make it in L.A. Uh, Bob Dylan's manager, his name was Elliot Roberts, was my manage, manager. He managed Bob Dylan, Tom Petty, Neil Young, and me. Mm. Uh, big difference between me and those other artists. <laughs> but and, the, and that had to have been real exciting to get that opportunity. That, that was uh, amazing. That was amazing. But it didn't go anywhere. And uh, after the Rodney King riots, uh, you were almost two, and mm -hmm. we wanted to get out of L.A., and so we came to Nashville. Yep. And um, That's where I grew up. You're in Nashville, grew Tennessee. up here in Nashville. Then um, kind of transitioned as a recording artist in the Christian music industry. As a Christian artist, I have about Six albums out, and Adrian Ballou, guitar player for uh, David Bowie and Frank Zappa and Talking Heads and Nine Inch Nails uh, and King Crimson. He uh, played guitar on my records and co-produced, and he lives out here in Mount Juliet. So I love the story of how you met him. Tall, met him at a Wendy's. Yeah, you were just and checking out at Wendy's. Adrian Ballou, you're like my favorite guitar player on the planet. You know, I was a huge Adrian Ballou fan. And uh, all of my, many of my solos on my record were, were I was trying to emulate Adrian Ballou. I mean, uh, mm. for real. <laughs> and so uh, to have the actual Adrian Ballou play over my attempts was amazing. And then uh, did that in the uh, Christian, you know, music world and the, had a few albums out there and the record company went out of business. And so the uh, pres vice president of the label, president of the label and I, we started our own company and then started making uh, music products that we sold to the church and then did a Christian children's worship series called Worship Jams, which was the, we did 800,000 units of that top selling worship record in America and no mm. one ever heard of, unless you watch Nickelodeon and watch SpongeBob. Because <laughs> we had... Uh... At the, I, I don't remember which iteration of it, but I was in one of the commercials. Yes, Worship Jams 3. <laughs> you were in Worship Jams 3. You in the band. For a split second. I was in, in a band in my high school. Uh, it was called No Name Nonsense because we couldn't come up with a name. So. You were rocking out on the Les Paul. Oh, heck yeah. You were rocking out, man. It was great. <laughs> Worship Jams 3. Go check it out on YouTube. The music industry kind of just after 2008, uh, things started tanking in the industry and it became almost impossible to sell plastic to anybody. And so my business partner and I, uh, he's kind of more of the marketing side. I was more creative. We both said we need to get over into film because that's really the only way to make, make an income. We started uh, consulting with a Christian company called Pure Flix. And then from there, working with Shonda Pierce, I did three movies with Shonda that were Fathom events mm -hmm. in theaters. Uh, and they were all, the first one was a number five movie in America the night it came out. The other two were both number two in America the night it came out. So they're very popular. And then I did a, uh, also a fathom event for Russ Taff, mm -hmm. uh, which was in the top 10. And then because of that, then, uh, the Kendrick brothers who, uh, are Christian filmmakers, they have done movies like courageous and fireproof and war room and overcomer, uh, Facing the Giants. They're you can one see of, here, the, the first film is available on Amazon Prime. Yep, Shonda Pierce, Laughing in the Dark. That was the first one. And then uh, a couple other ones. Yep. There's Russ Taff. There's, I didn't do Amazon. Girl Talk. I didn't do Girl Talk. Oh, Actually, okay. I have a director credit on that. You have a director that. credit on it. But, yeah. And here's but, the Russ Taff film. Uh, you can rent or buy these. You can watch some of them for free on Amazon. Yeah. Pretty Had cool. like nine awards on Russ Taff film, so that was kind of neat. Yeah. And then but through that, I met the Kendricks, and now I'm directing... Uh, 
their first doc that they've ever done called Show Me the Father. And it'll be in theaters. It won't be a Fathom release. It's a regular theatrical yeah. that'll be in theaters uh, September 10th, 9-10. So it's my first ever mainstream full uh, theatrical. Sony is going to put it out Man, as a regular it's... theatrical. So that's kind of a real quick uh, highlight. You can go to rickaltizer.com to get all the, the fine tunings. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll talk about the fine print here. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows what we'll do? So you started out as a writer, music producer, and then now you're a film director. Yes. And also my father and also grandpa now. I love that. So you got two little boys. Yes. Um, That's awesome. So yeah, moving back to Nashville the last four months, it's been really great to be home and to be around you guys. We're about 40 minutes away from each other. Um, and you guys come out and help with the kids, and it's great. So there yesterday it was awesome. <laughs> you sure were all day too. You gave us a whole day. That was awesome. Yeah, give you, you and your wife a break. Get a little some dates. <laughs> and we love being with those boys. We just oh, yeah. love it. So so awesome. So I think the things that I think would really help our listeners, who by the way, a lot of our listeners are photographers, filmmakers, um, you know, internet YouTubers, and things like that, but also freelance directors and. People who may want to do films like what you're doing, or maybe even some musicians that listen to this. What's been your kind of biggest uh, life lesson, if you will, on just the last, gosh, I guess, 40 years of your professional life in the creative yeah, field? Um, yeah, because... it's been almost 40 years, almost. Um, I think for me, the biggest thing for me, uh, and this was a hard lesson that I learned, was that uh, this is when I was a... a working so hard to be a, a recording artist and trying to make it and, you know, have dozens of fans. I say that I have mm -hmm. sold dozens of records, <laughs> um, was to realize that music was something I did. One of the many things I did, but it didn't define who I was. Mm -hmm. It's not who I am. Um, so that was the big, for me, the big jump was to be okay with, uh, maybe not having the acclaim of the world mm -hmm. or what, what, what you might, many of your listeners might say, this is what I would consider success. If I could do this, that would be success. And so to not achieve that, you know, cause I had, you know, to me, success was Bruce Springsteen. I was going to be that. Mm -hmm. And so when I was so obviously not that, when I realized I'm not going to be Bruce Springsteen, it was a hard pill for me to swallow now that sounds i'm embarrassed to say that about myself that i was actually thinking i was going to be bruce springsteen you know but the thought hadn't occurred to me that i mm -hmm. wasn't going to be you know so it was uh mm -hmm. those you those american idol singers you know who think they're and then simon cow or whatever you know gives it to <laughs> yeah, him <but> straight <laughs> yeah but it's not that it's not that extreme because you were a professional musician for a very long time. You just listed a bunch of things that you were successful at more so than other people. I mean, much more so than a lot of people who well, I've been, yeah, I've been blessed to be able to, it's just the, your, your personal dream of being Bruce Springsteen or whatever. Right. That, you know, has a lot of uh, ego attached to that. And I know for me personally, that was my whole thing with Indie Moguls. I'm the star of Indie Mogul and, I want to do this and that. And my whole identity got wrapped up in being the cool guy that is the host or in your case, being a rock star. Right. But here I am now making a full-time living doing video. I'm still mm -hmm. enjoying sure. it. Yep. And you're, you were making a full-time living making music. I yep. mean, it's not like you were working at uh, yep. somewhere else, you know? Yep. Well, I'll tell you with, with 36 years of marriage behind me and uh, I'll just say, you know, for those people listening, um, and we've talked about this, you and I, uh, I've, I prioritized my family and I, I made a conscious decision. I don't want to put a career over my family ever. Mm. And so I would make decisions and make, I made job choices and job decisions based on that. I didn't go on tour, you know, well, my records didn't, you know, cause I didn't go on tour, but you know what? You, by the time I got my record deal, you guys are older and I wasn't going to go away for eight months just so that you could, sure. just so that I could sell 60,000 records. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just not worth it. That I never regretted that. That was always, that's always the right move. So for those watching who want, maybe want to do something in film or want to do something in, in photography and you're kind of doing a job that you're not so crazy about and, and you got a family, 
I say just make whatever is the best decision for your family. Mm -hmm. That's the right choice to make because on your deathbed, you're not going to say, wow, if I could just had another hundred thousand subscribers. <laughs> sure. If my videos could have just had a, just a few more views, you're not going to think that at all. You're going to think about your family, about what's important. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's my advice to anybody is put your family first. Yeah. Definitely make every decision based on well, what's best for my family and you won't regret it. What you, if you're a single dude that's in his twenties right now? Well, listening. you know, at that point, this is the time. This is the time. If you're single in your twenties, this is the time to go for it. This is the time then to be in the band that lives off of that, you know, uh, you sleep on the bus and you get all the pizza you can eat, you know, and that's <laughs> what you make, right? Yeah. I get to sleep on a bus and, and, and get, and get all the free pizza I want, you know? Yeah. For um, me, that was, uh, traveling the world, doing these mission videos. Um, they paid my, for my travel, but they didn't pay me anything, you know, cause I didn't need the money. <laughs> you went to Haiti, you went to Dominican Republic, Africa. I mean, all over the world, you're going and you're making a difference and you're make, you're doing something that's <clears throat> positive and, and, and you and, did that with, with songwriting and the bands that you were in, playing in all those gigs in L.A. and stuff that Mom and Gina and everybody would go to. <laughs> yeah, I think it's an interesting uh, fact that you, you told me that you, um, because you're around during the Guns N' Roses era mm -hmm. and you're from, you were playing shows around there. They were up and coming when you were yeah, mm -hmm. touring and stuff. Yeah, Guns N' Roses, Poison, Motley Crue, they were all... They're all L.A. Kicking around bands. the L.A. scene. Yeah, Gazzari's and uh -huh. the Whiskey and all those those clubs. And I was playing places like uh, uh, Madame Wong's and Club Lingerie. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I never heard of that. Club Lingerie. I was one of the clubs I played. It was just a, it was just a divey rock club, you know. Yeah, and that's cool. I think I played the Roxy once or twice and, you know, some of that. But You got know. to see some cool shows. You got to see Paul McCartney. Yes, eighth row. Played yeah. the troubadour. I was I was on stage at the troubadour. Come on, that's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, you know, it was it was a good time in L.A. But uh, after we had you, it was just evident that you know we needed to get yeah to a place where you could have more freedom and a little bit more of a, a life where you've got a backyard and you can run and play sure. and you have liberty. Liberty is is a key. You could get on your bike and go. Mm -hmm. And you had liberty to go do things, whereas in L.A. you don't. So let's talk about the filmmaking journey, um, specifically the Shonda film, because that's really where this all started for you. Um, just to put a timeline together, I was already doing weddings and documentaries and different things for a couple of years. And then you kind of stumbled into this filmmaking thing. And I was really impressed with how you handled it. We had some some funny, like, grinding moments where you would tell me to like, I was helping you on some things. You would tell me to do something and I'd be like, no, that's the wrong thing. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it was a weird dynamic for a couple of years. Cause you were learning how to be a filmmaker, Yeah, but you were also the boss uh, who didn't know what the heck he was doing. <laughs> and his son was like, <laughs> right. My son, your son, but also the hired hand essentially. So like 22, how old were you when we did Shonda? Yeah. Like 22. Yeah. I don't know. Well, um, Shonda Pierce is a Christian comedian. She got an award from the RIAA. They're the ones who give out the gold and platinum awards. She got an award for the top selling female comedian in history. So um, she has sold more as far as gold and platinum DVDs than any other comedian. That includes period. Ellen and uh... Ellen DeGeneres, Roseanne Barr. I mean, you name the L L Lily Tomlin, you name the female comedian. Shonda's out has has more gold and platinum discs. So, um, very well known Christian uh, comedian in that that market. Um, her manager, you know, managed uh, uh, Robin Williams and Billy yeah. Crystal and Woody Allen, and so he's very well well up in the in the high echelon of of comedians. And um, so I was working with her. I had been doing videos and editing um, in Sony Vegas. Fun. Vegas using it wasn't even Sony it was Soundforge when it started oh, okay <laughs> um in Vegas I uh -huh. was cutting and editing in Vegas because yeah. it, it Vegas started out I it's don't know easy. if you know this Vegas was a multi-track recording software okay it was a multi-track software that turned into a video editing software so all of the uh the oh what's it called you know the, the timeline the interface, the, the, interface. the interface was all f for audio it was familiar to you 
so familiar and it was so easy. You know, yeah. Premiere Pro is like, well, you got to click the control, the shift, the R, the M, and the and the the, the tilde, and then you can copy. You know, it's just it was just <laughs> Premiere is like so difficult beyond what it needs to be. And whereas, yeah, what was so great about you know Vegas? You want to fade it out? We just grab a little corner and you turn it. You just pull it. There it goes. Fade. Yeah. You don't have to do control D. You know, you don't have to do any of that. It's true. Control it's true. shift D. You know, you just grab it. <laughs> I think a lot of pro users would argue that hotkeys are faster because you don't have to you don't have to move as much. But yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> and anyway, so it was easy. It for is me. easier to learn. It was easy for me. So I was doing home videos. I was doing some YouTube stuff. And I started doing some stuff for Shonda. We were helping her uh, do marketing for her, my business partner and I. And I started doing some some songs, some silly, fun songs that she had. Mm -hmm. Redneck Woman, you know, and different things like that that we did, kind of parodies. And uh, so she said to me, and I had been doing some, you'd actually help me, you know. Hey, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, we're going to be, I'm going to be in your city, you know, next you know, June the 15th, you know, come yeah, see Facebook you know. videos. And yeah. Stuff. That kind of stuff. So little promotional things. So we, we, uh, I was doing that for her. And then she said to me, she goes, well, Rick, I want to make a movie. And I said, I can't help you make a movie. I mean, I've never studied filmmaking. I've never nothing, you know, mm -hmm. I saw you, I saw how you were doing these wedding videos and telling stories. Mm -hmm. And I saw that one. Okay. You know, that makes And that, then the little DSLR cameras the were... D DSLRs were coming out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Shonda said, yeah, I'd like to make a movie. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, gosh, I can't... I don't know how to make a movie, but we could make a demo tape. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, you probably don't remember this, but back in the day when they had cassette tapes mm -hmm. and you wanted to get a record deal, you'd, you'd, you'd do your little demo and you'd put like three songs on a cassette tape and you'd send it to the record companies and the A&R yeah. guys would listen to your cassette tape and if they liked it, they would say, hey, this sounds good. Why don't you come in and we'll record you in our studio with a real producer and see what it sounds like. And so they, you do your little cheap demo and then they would bring you in to see if there was anything there. So I thought, why don't we go? I'll go on the road with you for a weekend and get like five minutes and we send it in and maybe somebody will see something they like, you know, and who knows? Direct the thing. Yeah, yeah who knows? And maybe somebody want to make a movie with you. And so she goes, okay. So I went out on the road with her, and um, at that time, her daughter had become estranged from her, and she wasn't she didn't have any access to see her daughter or her grandkid child mm -hmm. at all, mm -hmm. which would just kill your mom. You know, like if, like if you were told you can never see or talk to or have any any contact with your grandkids. You know, mm -hmm. it would just be like the worst thing you could, the most painful thing that could ever happen. Her husband was so distraught over this that he starts drinking at the age of 50, starts drinking, becomes an alcoholic. So she was doing the tough love thing at that time, and they had mm -hmm. separated. He, she, she said, look, you can't be here and to be an alcoholic. We can't do this. So that's, when, that's what was going on in her life as we do this on the road behind the life of a Christian comedian. So I go on the road with her, and we do some interviews. I get some film, some stuff of her doing some live concerts. I've got the, the Canon T3i camera yep. and the Sigma 30 millimeter lens. It's a good lens. And I had a, uh, <laughs> oh, you know, the little... The Cowboy Studio rig. It was like the one that clamps onto your mount. chest. Yep, paid 25 bucks for it. Shoulder yep. mount rig. Caleb, good old uh, Caleb Pike uh, recommends that one. Cowboy Studio. And I had the, the Rode... Uh, uh, Rode video mic. Video mic on it. Mm -hmm. That's when it was a long one. Yeah, uh, big, yeah, big, big old big chunky thing. Yep. And and I had a road lavalier going into an H1, you know, mm -hmm. a ninety nine dollar H1 that puts that has one double A battery in it. Yep. Thing's and, great. And, uh, and that was in her pocket. Mm -hmm. So, and then I had the H4 in, which I could get audio off the soundboard when I filmed her live. So, yeah, I put the camera on a tripod and filmed her live show and got the audio off the board. Mm -hmm. And then we did interviews where everything was on autofocus. I had, I had, everything was autofocus. Auto ISO, white auto balance, ISO, everything. yeah, everything was auto, and uh, and came back with, did it all in Vegas, Sony yep. Vegas, heck yeah, and came back with sixteen <laughs> minutes. That was, you know, she's talking about her marriage and her kids and all this stuff, and uh, so Shonda and her manager took me to this pizza place downtown, and I remember was it Bella Napoli? 
No, mm-mm, oh, okay. no, but it, it was good. But it was this little small pizza place, and we were sitting on a booth. I remember exactly where we were, and they said, "Rick, we love this. We want you to make this." Mm-hmm. And I start. I'm going. Okay, this is an opportunity, great opportunity. But the the heart rate starts fluttering. It's like I have. I'm in panic mode because I have no idea what I'm doing. I mean, I've sure. never made, made a, a movie. No, I've never. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, this will be something we'll just probably sell on a product table. You know. Sure. Well, okay. You know, Shonda felt comfortable with me. We known each other for years. Well, that was the so, thing that why it came out so good is that you've already known Shonda for years, working with her with the marketing stuff. So she was able to open up to you more than others. She was able to open up, and and I found out, which I didn't know till later, that I have a, uh, I can interview people and get um, get people to talk about things that they normally might not, and which I didn't know I could do. You but, have a, a skill for that, which I didn't know was there. But I can I can do interviews. I didn't know how the, how important that was for a documentary filmmaker, the ability to do an interview, and like on my podcast that i have mm-hmm. you know i've done 150 shows and so but the shonda was really the first thing i ever mm-hmm. did like that and she was really opening up and sharing so we I, we go ahead and start making this thing and it's just going to be i'm thinking for her table mm-hmm. product table then they say we're going to make this a fathom event she had had a booking agent had run off with a hundred thousand dollars of her money and she lost all these bookings she said you know i'm in, i'm in all this trouble this this has to be successful mm-hmm. i'm going what you know and then we're going to make it a fathom event can and you explain what fathom is a fathom people? fathom is at that time was owned by amc regal cinemas and cinemark and the three movie companies got together and they said let's have a night where we show an event it's not a film so they don't compete with the movie industry mm-hmm. that's the loophole is it's called an event it's an event so let's have the bolshoi ballet let's have the metropolitan opera you can see the whole Metropol- Metropolitan Opera season mm-hmm. uh, through Fathom events. And so it's a one-night mm-hmm. only screening at 7 p.m. Mm-hmm. You know, October the 3rd at 7 p.m. That's it. Mm-hmm. It's event. And so we were going to do her movie on, on a Fathom event, one, one night only. Mm-hmm. And uh, nobody knew how she was going to do. No one knew. And they have to um, – uh, one interesting fact about Fathom is, again, with the loophole to get around Hollywood is – they have to because it's an event it's as if it's a live show so when they hit play on the film it's actually playing across theaters at the same time no matter what time zone right is that right well it, at first it was something that was a satellite that oh, okay. that was being streamed through a satellite but then they they sent out hard drives oh, okay. to the to the to the movie theaters and they all just showed it at 7 okay um, regardless of time zone yeah yeah but gotcha. some of the theaters are set up for a satellite so then they would receive the satellite feed. Some of yeah. them do, but not all of them do. Okay. Um, but anyways. Yeah. And so the the, get- the stress of that, then there's now there's $250,000 in a marketing budget because mm-hmm. it's expensive to tell everybody in America about a movie. Sure. You know, and, and we got to tell them at a certain night, at a certain time, hey, everybody, you got to go. You know, so that the Facebook marketing and all the money that we had to spend mostly was Facebook. Mm-hmm. And uh, all the YouTube videos. But the, uh, sorry, I'm sorry to cut you off. No, no, just, no, no, this is great. <laughs> the the movie itself, the the way that it, it took three years to make it, um, and I don't know if you shared all that yet, but basically we knew that Shonda had kind of the, the power of the audience, but we didn't realize she had it the way that No, it yeah, we, we didn't out. know. So anyway, as we're making this film, you know, all these pressures start coming up. Of what? You know, I don't know what I'm doing. I've never done anything like this before. I'm making it up as I go. I make you the the uh, the DP, the director, photographer, and you. You know, all the good shots you did. You know, with that black magic <laughs> pocket uh-huh. cinema camera. And then I, I also had a C100 on occasion as well that we'd rent. Yes, yes, that interview we did with her was just on the C100. Mm-hmm. Um, but you wanted with to... her and her husband. <laughs> yeah. You wanted to give me credit as DP. I was like, please don't. Please don't. <laughs> half know, it the, looks great. Because half the movie was, was me. Was your sh- stuff. With all, all an autofocus. The stuff in it that looks good was you. <laughs> the stuff in it that looks terrible, that was me. But uh, it's, again, because you had no experience yeah. with shooting. But as we were making it, um, her husband literally uh, drinks himself to death and dies in the middle of making this thing. Mm-hmm. So what started out as this, you know, behind the scenes Christian, you know, 
comedian on the road turns into this whole other movie about how do you navigate your life and your Christian faith when everything in your life blows up. Her daughter won't talk to her. She can't see her grandkids. And now her husband has literally drunk himself to death and he dies. It's crazy. So that's why I made it three years because, you know, we had to take six months off or whatever while she just lost her husband. I know, yeah. You know, so it was such a powerful doc and uh, it was just powerful. Oh, yeah. Really. And, um, yeah, it was intense. And uh, it was a lot of work to edit that thing. You ended up kind of creating a, a method that is used in the industry, but you didn't know it. it was, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I um, transcribed the tr- whole movie, transcribed everything, all my interviews, everyone I interviewed, everything mm-hmm. was on, was transcribed. I put it all in eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper in, in, you know, uh, uh, binders with. You highlight yeah. the, the lines that you want to use. Then I started highlighting stuff. And then I, so I, then I took all the highlights out and made a, made a document with just the highlights. And I printed that out. Then I went through that and highlighted that. I didn't even know I could just, I could do it on the computer. I wanted it on paper. Yeah, yeah. So I could do this. I don't know why. Um, it's because you're 60. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> and, but it was, it, it was, I don't know, there was something about it. You it know. feels good. Then I did it again trimmed it again and took that made another document so i highlighted it three times i went through three highlights and then got it down to what i mm-hmm. thought was and then i took and then those. we made some s'mores with the paper that's that we, it that's it we burned some fire and then <laughs> i'm just kidding a bunch of trees were, were wasted in the process of this <laughs> and uh and then i uh i put them all put the little the segments on four by six index cards mm-hmm. so i had a box of index cards you know probably probably you know that that thick of index cards and I had little tabs and stuff, you know, for chapters and chapter settings. And I would write out chapters and markings and things. And then I could move things around in my box. So yeah. I could kind of edit the movie cause it's on paper. So I could easily just move sections around and I could see how the whole movie kind of flowed in front of me. Mm-hmm. Paper just, edit. And it's called a paper edit. I didn't even know that. Uh-huh. I didn't know what that was. That's how they do the bachelor. That's how they do reality TV. Cause they they get 20 hours of footage, you know, or more, and they got to crank it out. So the producers are constantly just editing on paper. Yeah. So that's how I, I didn't, so I met with an editor. I, I put, so I did the paper edit and then I actually made that edit in, in, uh, Vegas. Uh-huh. I actually <laughs> made that edit. Um, and then I went to an editor and showed him all the stuff I had done and, and my paper edit and then presented the edit to him. He goes, you know, most people have like 20 people do this. <laughs> you know that, right? I go, no. <laughs> goes, yeah, yeah. And so then he says, what you did was you edited. Mm. You gave me an edited movie, so I won't take a solo editing credit. He insisted that I get a co-editing credit with him, Yeah, which was nice of him. Um, but I didn't know what I was doing. But the story was, um, and what I found out was that the skill set in directing – is very similar to the skill set in producing an album. You have to work with artists. You have to get the best performance out of them. You have to try to mm-hmm. get a focused album, a focused performance, and it's all about story with a doc. And um, you know, you want to you want to have a setting where they can play their best, and you don't want to make it uncomfortable for them. And when you do the interviews, I didn't like bringing in. Well, we didn't have any money to bring in like twenty people. We couldn't have done that if we wanted to. But you know. You, me, and another person, you know, go in with a low, small crew, which is, I still do this. Yeah. I like to go in with a two-man crew that does lights and cameras so that it's just, it's simple, it's easy, and it's comfortable. Yeah. Anyway, we did it, made it. It was great having an actual editor because that was, at that point, was the first time I was actually collaborating with someone. Everything mm-hmm. was, from the audio to the, just everything, it was just a one-man thing. Yeah. So then the editor got involved. We, this was an editor who edited movies right. and, and very talented. commercials, a guy in Nashville. Andy Kouris is his name. Mm-hmm. Very talented, great editor. And um, so it, it becomes this Fathom event, and, and Fathom didn't think it was going to do very well, and, but our, our, we didn't know, so they wanted to kind of make— Do a s- test run or Well, something. they wanted to lower our cut. Okay. And so our manager, you know, her manager said, well, okay, but if it does this, then it's reversed and we get the better cut. And they said, okay. And Oh, I didn't know that. And it, it, <laughs> it was the number five movie in America the night it came out. 
Mm. I mean, it blew everybody away. And so we got the better cut. <laughs> and I remember way above what they were thinking. I remember going to see it with you. I think uh, Opry land, Opry, Opry land, uh, Opry mills, Opry mills theater mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. sold out theater. It was, yeah. it was completely packed. Um, Shonda's audience is, is middle-aged Christian women. And that's, you know, if you just talk to any marketing person, that's the best demographic <laughs> to sell. And they products. show up in, in minivans. You just need, you, know? you only need one woman who's a Shonda fan. Because even if nobody else has even heard of her, she's going to say, hey, let's all get together and go see this thing. And they'll all be like, okay. They pile in the minivan <laughs> and six of them come. <laughs> you know, they come in sixes and fours and threes at a time and, and uh, uh, pack it, it out. What's great is that it really was a great film. Like the, the actual foundation of that first film, there was so much story to it. Again, like the the alcoholism, the death and everything. And but then you, you did have bits of her comedy show and that kind of juxtaposition of her being on stage and, and telling a funny joke and then boom, hard cut to she's crying and dealing with all these emotional things. It was a, a roller coaster of a emotion ride. And Shonda's thing on stage is she's very transparent. She's not it's not phony. She's not like, you know, kind of coming in with an act. You know how Seinfeld kind of has his thing, you know, but she don't really know who he is. That's not Shonda. Shonda is just, she's just pouring (laughs) out everything she is on stage. So it was very natural for her to just be very open, very Mm -hmm. real, very vulnerable when I was interviewing her. So it was just really uh, intense in the way she would communicate. And um, they ended up showing the film again. I think the, uh, an encore pr- yep, presentation. Yep, got an encore because it had done so well. And then Fathom now was coming to you guys and saying, "Hey, you want to make another one? Let's make another one." And so you end up doing uh, a second film and then a third film. Yeah, we did with a second film called Enough, which was again, you know, I'd never felt like I was enough for my for my dad. I never felt like I was enough of a wife for my dad for my husband to stop drinking. You're speaking in the context of Shonda. Uh, Shonda, you know. <laughs> Feeling like she's never been good yeah. enough. Yeah. And so we we kind of, her life, it was such a big thing. We still had more, we still had an hour and a half mm-hmm. of her of her life to, to open up and explore about just the struggles of her own self-image. Did you and have it, more confidence going into that one? I, um, yeah, I did a little bit. I, I, we knew it was going to do well. We had pretty good feeling, you know, uh, it was a number two movie in American Night it came out. So it, it was... It was at that time, it was in their top five of best-selling Fathom events of all time. Crazy. At that time. Now, the, you know, the ticket prices have gone up. and Well, people don't go to the movies anymore. But yeah, but I mean, before, as of last, you know, before COVID, yeah, okay, ticket yeah. prices were higher. And sure, so, sure, you know, sure. it's not in the top five anymore. But, um, then, yeah, so then we did that. And then, so they went, hey, can we do another Shonda? Can we do another Shonda? And it's like, Shonda, I'm not going to do anything else about your life. We, we're done with that. You know, and so... <laughs> We did a we did a topical thing on unashamed being unashamed of being a Christian in a culture that's so uh, opposed to Christianity and people who are Christians uh, being unashamed and being bold about hey I'm a Christian that ended up going to Russ Taff uh, he heard about you through those films you were friends for years Russ Taff is a well known gospel uh, singer yes. Um, he had another amazing story that he wanted to tell. He and his wife were looking for the right person to do the project. You had him on your radio show. And by the way, you have a podcast, The Rick Altizer Show. If you listen to podcasts, which I know you are because you're listening to this, go check out The Rick Altizer Show, some amazing ep- uh, episodes. Four of them are by me. Uh, yes, they're great. <laughs> check those out first because they're really good. <laughs> no, but um, the, yeah. So tell us about the Russ Taft film briefly. So yeah, Russ was uh, you know very well known Christian recording artist, uh, mostly in the eighties and nineties. Uh, kind of he was kind of the upper echelon, but as he was at the top of the Christian uh, recording uh, world, he was struggling secretly as an alcoholic. Hmm. So he was in hiding. So he would go and, uh, as so many people in church go to church and they hide. They think you go to church, you have to put on this perfect face and everything has to be good. Well, guess what? Life isn't like that. Yeah. So Russ was ready to tell a story. He hadn't really told it yet publicly. Uh, since the 80s, he hadn't told a story publicly. So we we did the movie. It was very powerful. Um, it won a bunch of awards. It was uh, just it was well. Sh- this one was fun because I, I helped a little bit, but then also some of my buddies helped you as well. Yeah. And I feel like the Russ Taft film was the first 
like the Shonda films were their own thing. And, and, and a lot of the success of that was, um, I mean, Shonda's famous. I mean, she's very famous. But then the, the story of those Shonda films were just so riveting. And the Russ film, I feel like, was your like next step of next chapter of like, okay, this is a great story. This guy is also famous too in, in his own way. But um, you actually were really working on the filmmaking craft, I feel mm-hmm. like, on the Russ film. Yeah, more so. Yeah, it felt yeah, it, it definitely felt better and and seemed to flow better. And you know, I didn't want to make a documentary on uh, what a great singer Rust Half is. Oh boy, yeah. that Rust Half, he sure can sing. Like, here's Amy Grant. Wow, oh, yeah, and here's here's Stephen Curtis Chapman. Boy, that Rust Half sure can sing. You know, I just yeah, yeah. To me, hey, you know, I like seeing docs on artists I like. You know, and finding about how that record was made and this record was made. That's yeah. fine. But I just have no interest. I got no interest in doing a, a, you know, a piece. beauty piece on somebody. Just sure. no interest in that. And so you told the real truth about Russ and, and his struggles with alcoholism. Film again won a bunch of awards. And, and so you got the Kendrick brothers on, uh, who, by the way, the Kendrick brothers, if you're not familiar, are in the Christian world, the biggest filmmakers. They're the, the top. They're it's the top. the top of the heap. They've yeah. done films, uh, Fireproof, War Room, which was one of the top. 70 million. 70 million. Um, 70 million what? Dollars? Dollars at box okay. <laughs> office, which was huge for an independent. You yeah. Know? Um, and so they saw the Russ movie, and I had Stephen Kendrick on my radio show. And after the show, we started talking, and he was saying, you know, we've been thinking about doing documentaries. We think you might be someone we might want to work with. And I said, really, me? Well, okay. Because, <laughs> you know, all of their movies, uh, Alex Kendrick has directed. They've never done mm-hmm. a movie, a Kendrick brother movie that they didn't direct. So well, wait a minute, I'm a director. How How's that going to work? <laughs> but uh, so then we've done this movie that's going to be in theater September 10th. and uh, September 10th, 2021. And so if you're listening to this right now and you're a fan of, of this show, the Golden Hour Podcast, will you do me a favor and go to the theater on September 10th and watch my dad's movie? It would mean the world to me. And let me know in the comments if you do. Um, show me the father. Show me the father. Show me my father. There he is. I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, tell us about this film and, and the process of this one. This one is way different than the other. Th- yeah. If this you think is... about the Shonda films are their own like stage. And then mm-hmm. Russ was stage two. This is literally like stage three, yeah, four. This, this, yeah. I haven't seen anything like this before. Um, we haven't made anything like this either. Yeah. I mean. But I haven't seen anything like this. This is really different. It's, it's almost theatrical. And it's a doc. It's weird. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's big. Um, well, it is theatrical. Everybody yeah. go see it. September 10th. <laughs> At a theater near you. At a theater near you. Um, so Stephen had a few ideas of what he was thinking about what kind of docs they might want to make. And one he mentioned was, you know, how do we know the New Testament documents are reliable? You know, there's a lot of stuff you can talk about that, that show evidences that show how reliable they actually are. And and uh, one of them was on how to be a good dad. And, and one of them was on the fatherhood of God. And I said, you know, I think it needs to be the fatherhood of God because you can talk to me all day long about how reliable these New Te- Testament documents are. But if I can't connect with God as father, right, if I can't put the words perfect and father together in a sentence without the word not, you know, if I can't understand or relate to God that way, none of this other stuff matters. Mm. And so many people will project onto God things they feel about their dad. And everybody's got a fatherhood story. Everyone. And you get people talking about their dads, and it's... Whether you have a dad or not. I mean, that is your story if you don't have one. It's big. And it's emotional. And it's, I love my dad so much. I'm, you know, I, I don't know what I'd do without my dad or... I had no concept of what a dad was like, or my dad was, was distant. He was a liar. He was angry. You know, so all, everybody has these stories, but for so many people who struggle with a, with a father, right, who maybe didn't have a loving father, then to tell them there's this loving God, mm. that connection is, that's a one-to-one connection. And so there's, and so we wanted to help people, Christians, non-Christians, everybody, just connect the concept of God as a loving, perfect father. And so we, we've got, we do it through stories, very compelling stories. There's a couple of moments where it's like, what? You There's know, have, some serious twists and turns in this film. That are pretty awesome. It's honestly amazing. In fact, uh, I'm not going to give anything away because I, I don't want to spoil it. 
but one of the main characters is an NFL star Mm -hmm. and um, his story has been shared through ESPN and and you've done kind of a way more detailed analysis of their story. Um, And I think that story alone is, is worth seeing, but there's multiple stories again that are just like mind blowing uh, a couple weeks ago, the Baptist Convention, Southern Baptist Southern, Convention, yeah, which is a, it's a, I think this is they obviously didn't do it last year, but they did it this year, and a um, ton of people showed up here in Nashville. It's a big conference. Eight hundred people came in this room and saw the film. It was essentially the premiere of of your film, right? It was, and I was blessed to be there with with you and mom and uh, Aunt Kim and uh, Davo and and John, who also helped you with the movie. And uh, it was so cool to watch. John it. Melton and Dave Oglesby uh, were were helped film this. Yeah, they're so. the the cinematographer and the camera operators, and uh, yeah, it was pretty incredible to see it with another sold out audience. You know, eight hundred people um, to hear the gasps and the applause breaks and the the crazy laughter that would happen at certain moments. Uh, that had to have been pretty cool to kind of see like what the reaction was uh, in a live audience. Yeah, we'd been on it for a year and a half, been spending, had spent a year and a half on the movie making it. We spent about six to seven months editing it. So uh, spent way much than any of the movies I'd ever done. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we maybe spent five to six weeks editing, but I've never spent six months editing. Mm-hmm. So we really fine-tuned and <clears throat> fine-tuned and fine-tuned that edit. And, uh, you know, there's two Kendrick brothers, me and the producer, Mark Miller, and Mark and I edit, co-edited it together. So you, you had would, all four of us with all different, you know, yeah. ideas and none of us got what we wanted, you know, all the <laughs> way. Uh, but together it was a good, it was a really good match of, um, I was very much, it's got to be relational. It's got to be emotional. It's got to connect, mm-hmm. you know, this can't be male centric. It can't be just about guys where I got to communicate to women and, uh, you know, someone else was, I, I need scriptures, I need uh, lists, I need, you know, stats, fatherhood stats on how important, you know, this, this issue is in America. So, but together, the tug and the pull kind of really worked, I thought. Yeah. But yeah, it was neat sitting there with the audience and I found myself looking at people mm-hmm. instead of the film just to see, I knew what was coming up. I wanted to see how they would react. And one uh, man in front of us was... Uh, literally sobbing through it. I mean, his head, I mean, he was literally shaken. I mean, he was shaking. He was sobbing. It wasn't yeah. just like tears coming down his face. It was uncontrollable sobbing. I spoke with him for about 10 minutes afterwards. Uh, wow. He shared his story, his fatherhood story with me. But this, uh, this film is distributed by Sony, a million dollar budget on the thing. So you actually had, I mean, most of that's for marketing, but <laughs> you yeah, had. no, no, it, it, it it's, it's looks good. It's uh, we get we got NFL footage from the NFL, you know, so we got it's that's not cheap. Eddie George is in there. Eddie George. <laughs> I was in Eddie George's house. You know, and he's a running back for the Tennessee Titans. And he was, you know, just like well, this yeah. powerhouse running back. Me and uh, dad here are big Titans fans. So yeah, come on. That was definitely a fanboy <laughs> moment for you, right? In his home. I loved it. Uh, <laughs> and he's and he's a great guy. Yeah, it was wonderful. Amazing man. Wonderful. But it was it was it was neat seeing the reaction, got a standing ovation and all that stuff. But uh, shot on black magic cinema cameras all on. the way through. Four Ks, come on, baby. Black magic cinema camera, four K. Did you shoot ProRes? Yeah. We shot the, ProRes the and film we had profile. the Voigtlander the Voigtlander lenses. Yep. Yeah, that's what who, we used. Who recommended that camera? I know uh, this guy. To you, guy. I know this guy. <laughs> and he does these YouTube videos. And he does camera gear reviews. And he says, you want this and you want that. And you want this and it's that. And, and I know him real well. And all I got to do is call him up. And I say, hey, Dave. What do I what do I need to get shoot this? And he tells me everything. So thank well, yeah, you. Well, yeah, that's not the. I, I think the ideal would have been a different camera, but with the budget and with the constraints of it, it, you were able to plug it into the wall and not even think about battery life. Right. Yeah. You could plug in the little Samsung SD uh, yep. SSD thing yep. and just Terabyte. record nonstop. Um, those Voigtlander lenses are small, they're compact, and they're really shallow, so you can get that depth of field. They're really soft if you open them up all the way, so you can't go all the way open, but um, no, it looked good. It, th- they had a really nice look. Kind of had and a soft, vintagey look to it. I Very got these filmic. little these little uh, iPhone holder things for ten bucks on Amazon. Yeah, and put them on the camera, and the those SD cards fit perfect in it. Or the Samsung, the Samsung SSD, the, SSDs. I think yes. they're called the T3 or the T. Yeah, you mm-hmm. know, was it the SSDs? 
Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Those blue Samsungs. The T5. They, they fit perfect on those things. Ten bucks. You know. Now they have uh, SSD holders that cost you forty or fifty bucks. Yeah, that guy right there, the blue guy. And then. Yeah, there's plenty of companies that make official right. holders. Twenty two bucks. It's well, that's on sale. Ninety uh, bucks. Whatever. Yeah. Give well, me a break. Ten bucks, you get the iPhone holder. <laughs> That's Polar, what you want. Polar Pro needs to make some of these. We haven't yeah. gotten into cages yet, but uh, there you go. You can also just uh, I've uh, there's plenty of people that do that three D print that stuff too. Anyways, um, and, and again, it, I, uh, sidebar: uh, John Melton and Dave Oglesby were your shooters. Uh, you know, they did all the gaffing and the AC work and, and and DP work, and both those guys were my buddies from Dave Ramsey. We all worked together on the video team. And John was actually my boss. He was uh -huh. literally my boss. And then Davo, we call him Davo. Uh, he was essentially the guy above me. You know, we we worked together, but in a way, he was the senior of of my department. So it's so funny. After I quit, they quit shortly after as well. They went freelance, and they they've done really well for themselves. But um, you know, I was living in California this entire time. You're yeah, I'd had on you this. on this movie if you were here, but uh, you know. But yeah, I mean, they ended up doing it, and you became really good friends with both of them. I called you in the car. We were, we were coming back from Kansas City in the, in the in the van together, the three of us. And I called you, say, "Hey, I got some people in here." You know, and you go, "That's so weird. You're hanging out with my with my good close friends. You know, my dad is hanging out with them." So. <laughs> no, it's cool because you're you're a cool dad, so it works out. Well. It's amazing when your best friend is you, my two best friends are my two sons, you know, and it's high five, high five. It's, it's awesome <laughs> that, you know, we can go to the guitar shop oh, yeah. and spend a day That's looking a whole at guitars nother... and playing guitars <laughs> and we can talk about camera gear and we can talk about uh, parenting and about marriage and, you know, and we can be, I can do, I can be dad. We can have those dad son conversations, but business wise too. I mean, you've been my biggest, uh, you know, support. It's like, Hey, th this company wants to hire me in LA and I'd have to move. And it's a lot contract of contract negotiate, you know, just, just ideas yeah. on what the business side looks. So there's so many levels, so call many you things, for all that. Yeah. but it's so neat. So that thankful that I have you. And I know there's lots of people who've, who've lost their fathers who, um, you know, hearing that probably is painful to hear and, you know, to lose you would, would be extremely painful for me too. So I want to put out any sympathy to anybody who, mm -hmm. who has lost their father. Um, but for those, for those young dads, you know, prioritize your families because trust me, you just, you just want to have a good relationship with your kids because <laughs> totally. when they get older, it's awesome. It's the most awesome thing That's to a good just, point. To have my two sons be my best friends. You it know? pays off to, to invest in them when they're young. It pays off now when we're old because that built the foundation. And I had, you know, the, I wasn't always your friend then. You know, there were times where I had to be dad. You well, know, yeah, I had yeah. to, I w couldn't always be your buddy. Of course. But, but now that, you know, once you get older, you move out, that transitions and you kind of, we can. Yeah. So I just love it. I love our relationship. <clears throat> I love the fact that you have me get to have me on your show talk about whatever <laughs> well what kind of who would be on dave's show who else's dad has made four movies and one that's going to theaters i mean that's pretty cool um and this this film too to clarify we were talking about fathom events earlier this is not a fathom event this is a real distributed to movie theaters film so again if you're a fan of this show and let's just say a fan of me in any way uh, with my past youtube stuff please show your support go out and see the movie opening weekend because the way that Hollywood works is that that first weekend is the most crucial point um, to kind of gauge whether or not the film is successful. So if you're th kind of thinking like, oh, I got, you know, I don't know if uh, maybe when you see it, you know, out there, you're like, oh, maybe I'll just go next week. No, please go opening, opening weekend. Opening weekend makes the that's makes a huge difference, whether it continues to stay in the theaters, how many theaters it's going to be mm -hmm. in. That opening weekend is just crucial. It's called the Kendrick Brothers Show Me the Father. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's the website for it? Show me the father movie.com. So here we go. It's uh, brought to you by the Kendrick brothers, but it's directed by this guy right here. Rick Altizer. Yeah. How that happened. I don't know. <laughs> but, and there's, um, there's some of their other stuff. War room, fireproof, facing the giants, overcomer. 
These are all films that they've made in the past. Obviously not documentaries. Again, this is their first foray into uh, documentary films. Uh, the cool thing about documentaries compared to these uh, narrative films that they've done is that it's real. I mean, it's a real story. So it, yeah. there's there's more impact there. Um, we showed it. We showed it at uh, in Denver for the homeschool convention, right? So there was all these homeschool families, and 900 people saw it there. And I didn't so, know about that. Okay. Yep, 900 people saw it. It was at the end of the convention at 6:15, and they figured there'd be like 100 people there. Uh huh. And 900 people. What's this? Oh, they're just talking about. Hey, we got this movie coming out. And, Is there a trailer here? No. Uh. Uh-uh. Oh, you haven't done a trailer yet? Uh, they're working on one. Okay. I'm not involved in it. They okay. Have, they have. You get a trailer house to do it. The yeah, director, they have it. Directors never work on the trailers. Well, I have on all mine. I've made the trailers to everything I've ever done. Yeah. Except for this one. I know, but that's rare. I'm making this one. Yeah, it is. It is. I've, you were because we had no budget. We couldn't. We couldn't afford a trailer house. <laughs> I am the trailer house. I was. I did the music. I did. I did it all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was I talking about? Uh, the homeschool convention. Oh, so the homeschool convention. So they show it to nine, 900 people show up uh-huh. after the convention's over at 6.15 at dinner time. 900 people show up and see it. Wow. And then they did uh, surveys you know, oh, cool. at the end of the movie. Is this recent? Mm-hmm. This was last week or something? A week and a half ago. Okay. I didn't even know about 350 this. surveys. And they're very specific questions. What stories in the movie did you, did you relate to? Did you like the movie? What could be different? about you? All these different specific questions. They said of the surveys that they looked at, no one answered anything any of the questions they just all started talking about their fatherhood stories oh wow they were all saying my dad was this and my dad that either great bad whatever but what the movie does is it really just reaches in and has you connect with this whole fatherhood thing it's amazing so that to me was so powerful that they weren't even talking about the movie it hit them it touched them in such a moving way i will say bring kleenex (laughs) because you'll probably cry just Seriously, yeah, yeah, because yeah. that is such an such a powerful issue in our lives is fatherhood, is. and for us to deal with it uh, can can be painful, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. There's some beautiful stories in this. So, and anyway. it's well shot. So, moving on to a different topic <laughs> that I really want to talk about. Um, not only do you do films, but you're still currently doing jingles. Uh, a couple of years ago, you, you, you did more because you weren't doing these films. Um, but at some point you kind of became the jingle guy. And if you watch Nickelodeon in the last 10 years, um, you have whether, seen my jingles. You have absolutely seen his jingles. At one point um, I had a jingle on Nickelodeon every 15 minutes. I've done over a <laughs> hundred jingles. So people, there's some New York agency that works with you. Well, they're in Florida. Oh, okay, I thought they were in Y, but okay, never mind. In Y was Worship Jams. Okay, you're right. Anyways, the Jingles are Florida. It's a big jingle agency, and you're kind of the guy. I'm um, the guy. I'm, the, and I'm their guy. This one in particular, the Bacon Bowl commercial, is my one of my favorites. Um, this came out years ago, 2014. Yeah. Uh, kind of during the Bacon phase when uh, Jim Gaffigan was doing Bacon. I love you, Bacon. <laughs> Bippity boppity Bacon. Uh, <laughs> so you might even remember this product if you had one or saw this commercial. Comment down below. But this one, uh, tell me about the Bacon Bowl commercial. They wanted to do this commercial on Bacon Bowl, you know, on the Bacon Bowl. And uh, and I was saying, you know, it, it, it needs to be big. You know, it needs to be big uh, you, you know how the, the um the old spice commercials are kind of fun and silly oh yeah so i said you know the music's got to be big I, I knew a guy named i know a guy named mark martell mm-hmm. who was a singer who uh was in one of my favorite christian bands called down here who uh did an audition for the queen extravaganza which was a a, a touring band that queen did uh basically they did a tribute band that they put out Mark and Martell. Mark Martell is. won the competition, and his his video of him singing um, uh, "Somebody to Love." Yeah, that's the original one. Went but. went crazy. How many does this have? Forty seven million views on him doing Bohemian Rhapsody. Mark yeah. Martell. He sounds just like. I'm just a poor boy. I need no sympathy because I'm. So anyway, anyways, Mark, anyways we Mark, kn- we've known him for years. The Bohemian Rhapsody movie. Mm-hmm. Anytime they're not using the actual album, it's mm-hmm. Mark. And you can't even tell. No, it's completely seamless. I, I sat and watched it and listened. And it's like, okay, that's not the album. 
That's Mark. He he went to Abbey Road Studios. Oh wow! And he did all the Freddie stuff. That's cool. I mean, it, that's Mark Martell. So anyway, I knew this guy saying just like Freddie. So I said, what we need to do is a queen like Bohemian Rhapsody, like this big thing in a jingle. For a bacon bowl. For a bacon bowl. So I wanted to do a 60-second commercial that's Bohemian Rhapsody. Mm -hmm. So they loved the idea. I said, I know this guy. So I sang the song in my – I talked to him on Saturday, sang it in my phone on Sunday. He says, I like it. I called Mark. He was leaving on Tuesday to go to England to record Bohemian Rhapsody, I believe. Oh, wow. And uh, – so I wrote the song Monday, did all of the all of the music in the morning. He came in, sang Monday night. He leaves Tuesday morning. I had it mixed and sent to them on Tuesday. <laughs> so from being phone call on Saturday, sending them a singing into my phone on Sunday, doing all the instruments Monday, recording Mark Monday, editing it and sending it to them on Tuesday. And, and this is what it is. Everybody loves bacon. What you making in your perfect bacon bowl? It's crunchy and delicious. It's possibly nutritious. It's music to my soul. It's the bacon bowl. We're turning bacon upside <laughs> down. It's brilliant and astounding. Its genius is confounding. Perfection to behold. Perfect bacon bowl. The easy way to make delicious edible bowls out of bacon. <laughs> so pretty. <laughs> you know I'm gonna love it. Just wrap your favorite cut of bacon and cook. Anyway, there you go. <laughs> it is so queen, and I know that that was that had to have been one of the most fun projects. That was a blast because you get to flex your your muscles with pr production. Yeah. You always strive to do you know Beatles, Beach Boys, Queen kind of <laughs> stuff. I mean, what what better job to have than to just do that? That was awesome. That was it, so much fun. It got written up in the Wall Street Journal, and it was on ESPN and. Um, so anyway, that was a fun one. That <laughs> Some was of the fun. comments, Freddie Mercury came back from the dead to advertise bacon. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Mark. I mean, Mark is so good and we had a blast. We had so much fun on that. It's crunchy and delicious. It's possibly nutritious. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody comments, dat dee dat do dat dee do. Somebody loves that possibly nutritious. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh my goodness. Best queen emulation. Who's the vocalist? Let's see if it, somebody knew exactly what I was thinking. Oh, Mark Martell. There you go. Somebody knew it. I'm not sure, but some of Papa Goose Records, if that helps. <laughs> Somebody's doing some research. Wow. Yeah, it's Mark Martell. You can download it. <laughs> no one's ever downloaded it. But some other... Um, I put it up for download, but no one's done it. Well... It's downloaded like you're not, four copies. It's okay. You're not a social media guy. If you no, were, I'm you, not. Could, you could. No, I'm not. I've talked to him about it. Um, it's a lot of work to run a social media <sighs> empire. Um, but, uh, some other great jingles that you've done, uh, that's still, that's still going. We still got about five minutes. I'm using the Olympus camera here. It cuts out every 30 minutes. Super annoying. C70 over here. Um, <laughs> but good to see you 70. Some other great ones were, uh, uh, what were some other ones that you did? Some jingles. Um, my favorite, uh, uh whoopee butts, whoopee butts, whoopee butts. It's a whoopee cushion, uh, plush toy that you squeeze and makes a, a fart sound <laughs> and uh, that was great i love doing that what was uh, one of the lines from that uh whoopee butts uh it puts a smile on your cheeks it's such a release yeah that one <laughs> it's uh, such a dad joke uh yeah. and then you did a uh, wubble bubble bubble ball uh um boxy girls uh wish me uh seat pets uh, just all these products flip -a -zoo. yeah flip -a -zoo, yeah cool. every toy like turns into something like it's a tent or it's a it's a backpack or it's a what was the know. pillow one wasn't that a big one where it was a pillow that folds in half and then it's a stuffed animal is that flip -a -zoo? maybe i don't know the pillow that flips for you not one it's two it's flip ring flip -a -zoo. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> And then with the with the kids worship stuff with worship jams, uh, your mentality was at the time kids bop was pretty you know no offense to anybody involved in kids bop was not well made, um, and you kind of took the kids stuff and made it 
like this, you know, made it good, you know, queen. And you kind of just honestly, you took the idea of like, if I'm not going to enjoy this, then I don't want to do it. Like, yeah, I had I had my my career, which was I made records that I liked. Make gold records. I make I make records I like that are not gold. <laughs> that was I, I put make, my pants on one t- 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 right. day at a time. The only difference is my records aren't gold. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I make linoleum records. My records are linoleum. Uh, and so uh, SNL reference. For yes, those of you. that's right. Um, but I said, you know, okay, I didn't have a career here, and, and my business partners, we need to do worship music for kids because all the worship music is for adults. There's nothing for kids, and I'm going. Well, if I'm going to have to do cheesy Christian worship music, it's going to be the best cheesy Christian worship music you've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. So it actually was well produced and sounded pretty pretty good. You and know? Uh, one of my first animation uh, jobs was that. Uh, which what song was that? Here yeah. it is. Worship jams. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. So this was my first animation project. I used Toon Boom Studio in 2006. So that would have been, I was 15, 16. That's our friend Trisha singing. Who's just at her son's wedding? Anyways, so yeah. I, so no, it's funny that I did that. Bop, 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 bop. It's pretty I rocking. Was, I, was, I was ripping off... Uh, my Sharona, or bah, 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 bah. and then, <laughs> yeah. hey, hey, na, 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 sha, la, 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 sha, la, la, I love you. That's not in the song. You know, I added all that, yeah. you know, because it's just basically one little verse. So that's the kind of stuff I would do is I would try to, of course, I don't get any writer's credits for all the stuff I'm, I'm writing and adding. Well, you're, you're doing you a know? cover of it. Yeah, yeah. but I'm, I'm, I'm putting stuff in that wasn't in there. But Has, anyway. But yeah, you did Worst Gems 1, 2, 3, 4. Four, three. 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 Then I did a Christmas. Okay. Worship then, jams. One, two, three, and a Christmas. Did you guys just decide you were done doing it? Like, cause yeah. Well, what Kids happened, Bop is on forty. They're still making them. Yeah. Um. We we were just done the the DRTV. That's direct response TV, where you put a CD up on TV and you sell it. That just kind of died. That was the market for how you're selling it on yeah. Nickelodeon and, and stuff. And then and then we did Walmart and Target at full retail. We were selling these things yeah. at full retail. Well, you know, by the time 2008, 2009 came around, that was over. It's just a new strategy because kids, done. kids bop is now, it's all online stuff. They're doing, uh, obviously streaming. It's, all, it's online. Now. And then they're doing all these big music videos, right? With 24 million views. On That's it. how they're doing it. So they're not selling any more plastic because nobody buys plastic anymore. No, no. Um, it's and, all online. That's how they've t- done it. So yeah, it, I think the reason why it works so well with Kids Bop is because secular music has stuff in it that you really don't want a kid to hear. So you listen to Bruno Mars Kids Bop version with the kids around. You can listen to Twenty Four Karat Magic in the Air. You know, and he's instead of saying liquor, they say water. You know, <laughs> but in the worship industry, it's already family friendly. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so, they just hadn't at that time. There hadn't been anything for kids, and it worked well. I, it I'd, did. It was huge. Yeah, it went real well because Sunday schools would play it, and you could you could sing along to worship in well, Sunday school. Yeah, but what 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 where we were were selling was Target and Walmart. The parents were were getting it at that time. Um, Hannah Montana hadn't come out yet, and the Jonas uh-huh. Brothers hadn't come out yet, and it was right after Britney Spears had gone nasty. And sure. Justin Timberlake had gone nasty. So there was nothing for kids. In the pop world. Nothing. So this thing comes up on, you're watching Spongebob, and here comes this, Mom, I want, I want. Then they go to Target or Walmart. Mom, that's what I want. Mm-hmm. And the mom's in, and going, well, you know, this is positive. It's sure. good, you know. And so, so. I, I would argue that in today's world, in the today's climate, you could probably do Worship Jam still, take modern worship music, turn into TikTok videos and yeah. YouTube and it, you know, it would be a whole new uh, strategy. Yeah, it'd be a full time job for for one person. You're gonna you would need a crew of people, and you need funding. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah, you know, we just don't have. It's just, no, no, I know, and it's it's not a it's not the same uh, it's not the same market. I put them all up on uh, CD Baby, and for some reason they're not on Apple Music. I don't know why they're not on Apple Music anymore. They no. were, but they're off now. So I got to figure that out. But anyway, anyways, <laughs> but uh, I digress. You always say kids bought or uh, worship jams was great. Paid off the house. <laughs> yeah. And uh, 800,000 records, man. I paid off my home. It's pretty it's awesome. great. I mean, here we are, at, you know, kind of at the end of our conversation. And 
you've been a creative for 40 years, 30 years, you know, ish. Um, you wanted to be Bruce Springsteen, but you just told me you sold 800,000 copies of something. Come on, come on. You're about to have a movie going to theaters. I've done a million records of all of every few. Put yeah. everything together. I've done a million. I've sold a million records. Yeah, that's going platinum, isn't it? Come on. You. Uh, Who gets to say that? Number one movie in the world with Shonda. You know. Yeah. I, well, I've had three movies with her. They've all been in the top five. Uh huh. Russell's number nine. And here we, every movie I've ever made's been the top ten. And now you're working with the best Christian filmmakers in the industry. Give me a break. <laughs> How does this happen? And you, yeah, and so like God, that's the only way I can say it. Exactly. It's the only way. So you may, I think the moral of the story is life is, is long, you know, Lord, Lord willing, we, we, we all live a healthy, uh, long life and something doesn't cut it short. Um, you know, you got to take every day for what it is. That's where the whole spend time with your family thing comes is like, you got to live as, as though today isn't guaranteed. With that being said, if you're in your twenties, your thirties, you know, I'm thir- I'm about to turn 31, um, in some ways, I feel like I've been doing this forever. I mean, I've been doing this since I was 17. So it does it does feel like it's been a long journey already. But I still have a lot of career left. Uh, people listening to this who are in their 30s, 40s, you still got a, a good productive 20, 30 years. I mean, you were telling me you got a productive 15 years. That means you're, you're, you're going to be creating art and making films in your 70s. I figure I got a good 15-year run. Ridley Scott is in his still. 90s or something, right? That's why, though, for me, for me I don't want to do anything that just isn't going to make a difference. Ridley know? Scott is 83 years old. He's still making movies. Yeah. I mean, I hope people are entertained when they see the films, you know, but gosh, I'd hate to spend three years or two years just to do something that just entertains somebody. And that's all I did. That's all the purpose was. Sure. I don't want that. Yeah. You know, you're talking about, you know, Scorsese calls these Marvel movies, uh, theme park rides. Yeah. You, you know, they're not really movies they're theme park rides. Which is great. Theme park. I love theme parks, you know, and I love roller coasters. But, gosh, I just don't at this age, you know, I don't want to yeah. do that. I want to make a difference. I want to do something that's really going to help people and make a difference. So mm-hmm. I hope they're entertained. I hope they, they find it. But, you know, helping somebody deal with their alcoholism, helping somebody deal with their fatherhood issues. I mean, to me, that's how I want to spend the rest of my life. And, um, you know, I think if you have talent, if you have ability, it will – present itself to you you'll find things that you you know and it doesn't have to happen today tomorrow keep prioritizing that family you know soon the kids are going to grow up they're going to they're going to leave you and if you're all of your kids are going to leave you (laughs) they're going to grow up and move out sure and they're going to leave you you know so it's like and i don't mean that in a bad way you want them to i wanted you to grow up and go change the world and yeah yeah i didn't want you staying at home for the rest of your life i wanted you to move out and go change the world and uh that's what you want for your kids and if you're in your 20s and you're single and you're listening to this, go get it. You know, go after this it. This is it. Go for it. Go do things. You you can take chances now that you might not be able to, mm-hmm. that you shouldn't when you get older. Because really, the priority needs to be your family. Well, yeah, but I've been telling people if I got this indie mogul job six years ago when I didn't have kids and we were newlyweds, it would have been it would have been great. You know, just living in L.A. in an apartment, me and Laura. She probably would have found a cool baking job mm-hmm. out there because mm-hmm. she's a pastry chef. Um and it would have been fine, but having two kids stuck at home with stay-at-home wife during the pandemic and living in an expensive place uh, just wasn't a good, healthy place for my family. But again, if I got that opportunity six years ago, it would have been a different story. And your situation is so great right now. I mean, yeah. it's, it's great location. Kids are so kids are doing great. You yeah, know, yeah. they're so sweet and so full of life and joy, and it's, yeah. it's great. That's been, uh, again, coming back to kind of what we talked about at the beginning of this uh, podcast, that was my journey these last four months is what is my identity? I think I wrapped myself into what I did too much. And whether you believe in in Jesus or not, I think everybody can kind of reflect on that idea that what, what do you actually identify yourself as? And even if you're not a Christian, that could just be like, am I focusing way too much of my energy and focus on career when there's all these people around me that I could be pouring into and, 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 and learning from and growing from. And, um, I think being a more complete and healthy person, it gives you more value in life than, uh, than just career all the time. The result of self-centeredness always is depression. Mm. Every time just, it's a straight line, self-focus, self-consciousness, Everything, you know, we got self everywhere, self magazine, selfies, everything's about self. 
And the result of that is depression. When you're others centered, when you're thinking about other people, my family, my wife, helping other people, people who are in addiction, I want to make a difference. When you're doing that, it's awesome. It's a great way to live. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've learned because I was very self-focused in the early part of my life and had a lot of depression because of it. And it didn't bring me anything but negative, mm. frustrating depression. Yeah. Whereas when you're living for others all the time, always, that's the right way to go. 100%. Every time. That's great, the right call. Great way to end the show today with Rick Altizer, a.k.a. my dad. Thank you for listening. Again, another reminder, September 10th. September 10th, 910. Show me the father. 2021. Go see the film in a theater near you. Um, I think by September, uh, no matter where you are in the country. And by the way, this is only in America, right? We do have international listeners. Uh, yeah, it will be. It will be international as well. It won't be September 10th, but it will go yeah, all so over the world. If you're if you're in London, I know we have some some England listeners out there. Um, then just it's keep coming. an eye out. You know, I'll I'll update you guys on Twitter. Uh, and uh, go to the Show Me the Father movie uh, to get details on that. So before we hang up, okay, I just hang up. The whole thing. <laughs> yeah, before we hang I up, I just want to say what a what a blessing and honor it is to be on your show. Thanks for having me. Of course, I'm so proud of you. I love you so much. Love you too. You're 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 <laughs> such a great son. You're such a great friend, and I'm just so proud of how talented you are, and what a great dad and and husband you are. And I just want you to know how pleased I am that I get to be your dad. Thank you very much. <laughs> happy to be your son. Um, and I'm happy that you listened. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you, guys. Leave a comment down below. Let me know your thoughts on this. And I'll share that information with my dad because uh, he doesn't go on, on YouTube and check these comments. So I'll, <laughs> I'll let him know. And uh, do, are you on social media anywhere? Or maybe people could reach out to you, you on can, your website. RickAltizer.com. You can uh, you can comment me there or send me a, a an email from there and i'll give you a free scripture memory album that i did there that you go. sounds kind of like the beach boys and the beatles oh it's a great album um if you want some free music you want to go check out my dad's stuff for Mm-hmm. all right that's uh that's it this is the golden hour podcast brought to you by the polar pro studio if you need any filters at all check out polarprofilters.com for drones for cameras um I mean, you've used Polar Pro stuff. I have. Whether you realize it or not, on uh, drones. Yep. They're kind of the king of the drone uh, filter com- uh, you know, companies out there. And, uh, of course, the Peter McKinnon filter is one of our most popular units as well. So go over to PolarProFilters.com. Check that out. Thanks again, Dad, for being on the show today. My pleasure. And uh, m- maybe we'll have to have you on after the movie's out, see how it did. Great. Love it. See what's next. Great. Y- you owe me three more. Yeah, that's true. I got to catch up. We did four on your show. So 